thank you for, we know that both your glory and your beauty are to rise upon us, Lord. We know that you want to put both of them on us. You want to cover us with your glory and show your beauty. So God, we thank you for naming us Sozo, for helping us to understand that the only safety in life is really being hidden in Christ. The only security is being redeemed by Christ. The only covering that really works is the blood of Jesus. So God, as every time we mention that name, every time we say so-so, we mean safety and refuge and redemption from destruction. God, and that should encourage us, and we allow it to. So God, no matter what's going on in this world, no matter what's going on in our lives, we confess that you are God, you are mighty, you are glorious, you are gracious, and you are merciful. And so we are assured that we are accepted in the beloved and we're safe there. Do you know that you're safe in the beloved with God? Do you know that you're accepted there? That even if the world doesn't accept you, God does. He's already accepted you and I can prove it to you. He died on the cross for you 2,000 years ago. And he said that he was going to do it once and for all. I don't know. That has to sink into you. you got to get that. Once and for all. Once and for all. And in case you think you're not included in that, I'm here to tell you you are. Whether you've accepted Jesus or not, and this is the beautiful part of the gospel, and it causes us to go out into the world with it, because whether they've accepted Jesus or not, they're accepted in the Beloved. All they have to do is say, yes, I want it. And so there's no person on the planet that you can't preach the gospel to. How many of you would say amen? There isn't a person out there that shouldn't hear about Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what the religion is. It matters what the truth is and where God is. And we say that God has shown us where he is. And because he's shown us where he is and we're convinced in our hearts that we know where he lives, we can go and preach the gospel to all creatures. And that's what he called us to do. So he didn't put us out there in a way that we, we can't accomplish. He actually put us out there fully able to accomplish what it is that he wants us to do. You say to yourself, well, you know, I'm not always Johnny on the spot with that. I'm not always ready to talk to people. I'm not always ready and willing to pray with them or minister to them or encourage them. So today I want you to get ready. I want you to pray, and I'm going to pray with you, that we would be ready in season and out, that we would be instantly ready to preach the gospel, to share the gospel, to be examples of the gospel, so that people can see and come to Jesus. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for putting us under the protection of the blood of Jesus. We thank you, God, for naming us Sozo, because it means safety and redemption and, and removal from the consequences of destruction. We thank you, God, for making an ark of safety here. But that doesn't mean we do nothing. That doesn't mean we sit in the house and don't care about who's outside. It doesn't mean we shrink away and don't pray for or minister to the world. It means that we actually have the confidence and the readiness to go out into the world and to minister and to preach the gospel. And thank you, God, that preaching of the gospel is what brings people into the knowledge of of the gospel is what helps them understand you and helps bridge between them and you. But then, God, we get out of the way and we watch you do your work because, you know what, you're the one that brings the harvest. You're the one that saves. So, God, we thank you this morning because you've given us a mission to go forth. We can feel you pushing us. We can feel that wind behind us saying, come on, get out there. Begin to preach. Begin to lay hands. Begin to speak more boldly so that they can see your conviction and they can know your commitment to your faith. And so they can know God. Lord, we thank you for that spirit of outreach that brings the wind inside the house to blow us all outside the house. We thank you, God, that you bring the increase. We praise you and thank you. We do so in Jesus' name and all agree. With that said, amen. Let's worship the Lord.
I close my eyes to see my King in majesty. Your grace compels my soul to love and draw.
can come up now. Somebody wanted to uh, share an encouraging word. So we're going to make you stand up here. And if the baby jumps, don't warn, don't tell us. <laughs> if, we see, if you see a baby jump, don't say anything. He's just okay. here. He's just participating. Is that, He's cool. just here for the ride. I'm good. Um, yeah, I wanted to share during worship. Um, do you guys know that God sings back to us? Hmm. And um, I didn't know that. <laughs> And I, um, when we were singing All I Need Is You, I heard him sing, singing and harmonizing with us, singing All I Want Is You. And um, it's a huge encouragement to everybody, but also to younger believers in the faith, not just age, but younger believers in the faith, those who are crying out and struggling in this life and in this world, to know that he wants you is a complete, it, 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 it's a pool. Okay. Jesus is our mediator in prayer and he prays for us and he prays on our behalf. And to hear that and to know that and to understand that he's pulling on the other side for us to know him too is huge. So don't be bogged down in your search and in your journey in listening and trying to find his voice and looking for him in your everyday situations. Because as we are struggling and we're crying out and saying, all I need is you, he's saying, all I want is you. And then we will get to a place where we're saying, all I want is you. And the word is just a slight change, but it means we're laying down all of our desires because we know him now and we know how good he is. So. Yep, that's Hallelujah. what I wanted to share. Praise God. Thank you. That's awesome. <laughs> Praise God. I've adopted her, by the way. I've, I've said her repeatedly that she is my daughter, and nah, I have no right to do that, but, but she's a sweetheart. And uh, I think that's what we do as, as elders in churches. We adopt the young people as we go forward. Because you never know when they're going to need another grandparent. Right? You don't know what, what encouragement you can offer. You see these little kids walking around. You see the older kids walking around. One of the things you have to realize as you get older is that you can be a stable encouragement to them. You can be a rock for them when they're struggling. When they can't go to, they think they can't go to their parents or whatever it is, they can't go to certain people, you can give them alternatives to go to. Can you say amen to that? And just encourage them. I mean, half the time it's just encouraging them that, that they need that they can go forward. Amen? You going to take it from me? Oh, you, you going to take it from me? I, thought he was done. I adopted him too. <laughs> Praise God. Here, now come get the mic, man. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. I get to play now, right? I mean, that's what I get to do. I don't know. How many of you know that uh, Caleb just graduated? Uh, woo! Which is really awesome. It's awesome anytime anybody graduates because it's a long road. And it's a hard road many times. And you know what? The devil tries to put things in front of you, but you, know, you make it through and you, you get to do the walk, which is, which is special. Um, UC is a great institution. I went there for a period of time. God bless them. Um, I think God blesses this city. He continues to bless this city. So it is worth our acknowledgement when young people sort of take those steps and make big advances like that. So if you get a chance, just sort of pat him on the back. He, I don't want his head to get too big. But it may be too late for that. <laughs> but he looked really special. I mean, I was watching him walk down. It was just like, man, he looked so regal. He looked like, it was like, yeah, I'm here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave a mark on life. Amen? I'm going to tell you a secret about my mom. The secret is she comes from royalty. Some of you have come to me and said, I don't know, what's that, what is that about her? What is that about her? What, what is, I mean, because you get a sense from her, don't you? 
you just get a sense from her. It's just like, man, there's a confidence. There's just a, you know she believes that she's special, but she doesn't lord that over anybody. I mean, it's a humility that goes with it, but there's a sobriety of knowing who you are and, 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 and what that means and where you've come from. She's, she's, she's royal. She's regal. And so put it in that context, because then I'm going to help you understand that you are too. And so it doesn't do you any good to walk around like you're not royalty when you are. I was reflecting on it, and I realized, you know, Jesus never denied his royalty. He never denied that he was God's son. He never denied that he was king. Actually, when, he, when they put him on the, on the pony and he went into Jerusalem, I mean, that was, that was a signal of his royalty. How many of you know that? When they were, and they were yelling, Hosanna. I mean, it was just like, no, no, he's the king. And we're honoring the king. His, his royalty was actually on display at that point, whereas it hadn't been in many other circumstances. People acknowledged him. Remember, they put a, th- a crown of thorns on his head. And that was a way to denigrate him because he was royalty. Somebody say amen. He was royal. They knew he had come from a, 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 a stream of blood, literally, that was regal. They understood it. He understood it. He didn't downplay. He didn't say, oh, no, 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 guys. You know, I, I find that we sometimes are kind of weird where we're like, oh, I just want to be humble. Well, be humble, but more importantly, be sober. And you may not understand the difference between humility, false humility, and sobriety. Sobriety is understanding who you really are. Can you say amen? And sometimes we Christians believe that God wants to press us down, and therefore we have to humble ourselves in a way that's silly. In other words, we go to God and we say, oh, I'm just a wretch, and, and you don't love me, and I'm trying to earn my way. That's false humility sobriety is to go to God and say to him what he says to you. And sobriety is going to God and saying, God, I know that you've adopted me into the beloved and therefore your blood not only covers me but is inside of me. My DNA is now your spiritual DNA. I'm your son and I need your help. Do you see a difference there? As opposed to begging for your healing, you go to God and you realize, you know what? I'm supposed to be healed because I'm a king's kid. And you know what? Racism is not supposed to impact me because I'm a king's kid. And so you then project out from your identity instead of letting the world decide who you are. Can you say amen? You, you, anybody here getting tired of the world deciding who, deciding who you are? Eh, you should be. You should be, and you should, you should not allow even people's definition of what group you fit into actually define who you are. You'll start to realize that God didn't make you out of the mold of a group. He actually, actually made you an individual. And you can travel the world, and you'll find people that look like you, talk like you, behave like you, and it's sort of weird, right? All around the world, like you. But God still made you an individual, And Scripture actually says that we're all stones. We're all individual stones. Because he didn't want us to see ourselves as as bricks that he sort of cookie-cutter made. He didn't make us as bricks. He didn't make us as a group. He didn't take all the dark-skinned people and make them all at one time. Can you say amen? You need to understand that because we act like that's true. It is not true. God didn't make groups. He made individuals. Can you say amen? He he didn't make groups, he made individuals. Here's a funny way that I figured that out. I actually traveled halfway around the world to Fiji, and I look like those guys. I look so much like them, they thought I was one of them. And so they would greet me whenever I'd go to the, I'd walk out of the hotel, and this guy, Bula, Bula. I was like, what is Bula? What does that mean, right? And at first I'm like, you're cussing me out here. I'm from the Bronx. You don't call me Bula. Because instantly I'm ready to fight. I said, what, what, what would you call me? And, they were, and finally one of the guys was like, it's like, why do you keep doing that? It's like, because you look like you're from here. Everybody thinks you're Fijian. You're a native. You're, you're, you mean you're not from here? No, I'm not from here. I'm from the United States. And they struck up a conversation. And they said, well, you look like us. And we look like you. And so we just sort of assumed that you're one of us. 
But then he started to realize, no, I'm an individual. I just look like them and have some characteristics that were similar. So we had a beautiful exchange because they actually adopted me darn near. They were like, here's our friend from the United States, looks just like us. He has to be Fijian. And so every time we see him, we're going to, Bula, Bula, what's up? What's up, bro? Okay, is that good translation? What's up, brother? What's up, brother? You're part of us. But God made us individuals. God really actually gives us some comfort in that he made us families so that we would see similarities, but he didn't want that to be the overarching identity that we had. Can you say amen to that? He didn't want that to be our overarching identity. That wasn't the point. It was to actually give you a sense that we're all woven together and we're related to one another. I walked away from that thinking, wow, man, how did that happen? And, and I really had a more of an interest in, in genealogies because I was like, okay, if I look like a Fijian, where do the Fijians come from? How did they come to be? Why are they on the island? I mean, you start asking questions about how we're knit together. You know what the answer is? We're all family. That's what the answer is. But as family, we are individuals. We are individually made. We're each fearfully and wonderfully made. So God does not want the group to define you. He wants his identity on you to define you. Can you say amen? He wants you to understand that you are unique and you are a part of something. And in that uniqueness, that is the beauty of who you are. And it's okay to accentuate that beauty. It is okay to boast in what God made you to be. Can you say amen to that? It is okay to boast in who God made you to be. I wouldn't boast in my nature. I no longer boast in, you know, the, my skin color or anything else like that because that's not under my control. That's, that's not something he, he, it's just a part of the group that I'm a part of. And God wants me to understand that I am his son and that is a personal thing. He wants me to understand that I am a son of the king. And because I'm a son of the king, what does that make me? Yes. I know for some of us, it's like, oh, no, I grew up on the wrong side of the tracks, or, or I don't really look all that great. I mean, we find all these reasons not to believe that we're royalty. Well, royalty is something that's associated with who? Why are you royal? Who makes you royal? Yeah, why? Amen. He's the king. <laughs> the royalty comes from the king. Now, let me help you with something, because sometimes Christians are like, well, but I've never earned it. Well, you don't have to earn it. You have to live it. You have to be it. You have to engraft that identity into your life. You have to say to yourself, here's the model of who I'm supposed to be by the identity of Christ, and I have to become that. I'm becoming transformed into the image of who? Christ. I'm becoming... Maybe I'm not communicating that well. God wants you to be transformed into his image. He is the king, and you are royalty. Can you say amen? You are royalty. Oh, but pastor, I don't really act like... Well, start learning how to act like royalty then. Do you know the king and queen over in England, which is actually an interesting picture, you know they train up those, the sons in the house. Somebody say amen. They train up the sons in the house. What do they teach them how to do? Anybody? Act like royalty. Lift yourself up. Know our heritage. Understand your authority. Those are all the things that God wants to do in your life too. He doesn't want you to walk beneath your station. He doesn't want you to walk in a way that's unmiraculous. Why? Because God is a miraculous God. Can you say amen? He doesn't want you to walk like you're a pauper because he says, I own a cattle on a thousand hills. So don't walk around like you ain't got nothing. You got plenty. You just don't know where to go to get it. Can you say amen? And in fact, you're confessing things over your life that actually would deny your royalty. It would deny where you come from. Well, God has an answer for that too because when you read the prodigal son or whichever way you want to see it, it's actually a prodigious father what is a prodigious father, probably? A father that has much? A father that commands slaves? Has slaves? Has property? A father that at some point when you come back, he puts a robe, a ring, and sandals on your feet and throws a, a massive party. 
What kind of father is that? Yes. Do you see it? He was a king. The prodigal son, well, again, whichever way you want to see it, was the son of the king. He was the son of a king. And God wanted you to see not only that the door was open for the son to come back and there would be a great celebration when he did, but that he was from royalty. And now, in other words, when he went and he, he sort of went into the world, took his inheritance, amen? That's what happened. He said, Father, I want the money that's owed me because I'm in, I'm in your kingdom and there's an inheritance being your son. I want to take that and spend that in the world. And he went out and spent it in the world, but he was still the son of a king. Can you say amen? He was still royalty who had thrown himself into places he didn't need to be because he was royalty. There was no reason for that. He threw away much of what the father had put in his life to protect him, to bless him, and to show him that he was royalty. And it came out in his behavior. And that behavior actually betrayed something that was a lie. He, was, he had come from royalty, but he had decided not to live up to it. Can anybody say amen to that? God wants us to live as royalty. Oh, but pastor, I've seen lots of people use that in a negative way. So what? Have you seen anybody make a wrong turn on the highway? Are you saying everybody should stop driving? Maybe we should ban cars because some people get into wrecks. You see how the logic just doesn't fit? Just because, as a great example, Christians don't do right doesn't mean you throw Christianity away. Don't let anybody argue that to you. You see what I'm saying? If you understand that because somebody abuses something doesn't make the something not worth it. I mean, that's just wrong logic. We, don't, we didn't tell all the cars. Do we tell everybody? One, I saw a wreck yesterday. Should we have just taken everybody off the road? No, because you mess something up doesn't mean that it's messed up. Because Christians don't do right doesn't mean Christianity isn't right. Can you say amen? Why? Because what's Christianity based on? Christ. It is part of the definition of what the kingdom is. And Jesus Christ is the monarch of that kingdom with God. Can you say amen? That's why he's the example. That's why it doesn't make sense for Christians to live beneath what it is they're called to. Can you say amen to that? Now you're going to say, well, pastor, help me understand what it is that we're called to. I will. Because you need to understand it. But first and foremost, you need to understand that you're royalty. Can you say amen? Can you say that with me today? See, because some of you are going to unlock blessings simply because you're willing to admit that you're, you've come from, you've descended from royalty. That in fact, it is part of your DNA. It is where you have come from. It's your identity. And you need to learn to walk in that thing. You don't need to deny it. That's why I get into false humility. Oh, don't deny that you are blessed. Don't deny that you're supposed to be blessed. How many of you know you're supposed to be blessed? Come on, I, not enough people said amen. How many of you know that you're supposed to be blessed? How many of you know that there's royal blood inside of you spiritually? How many of you know that the curse of sin is now removed from you? How many of you know you've got white robes to put on, not scarlet robes? How many of you know that the blood of Jesus is there to seal the ring on your finger so that that devil can't come after you? Come on, you see that? And yeah, you can live according to the, pro the, the prodigal son's life. You can live beneath what God's called you to live, you know, the level you're supposed to live, but that doesn't make it right, and that doesn't make you virtuous. Come on now. You, you, for you to throw away the, the reality of being a child of God and being royal and called royal, for you to throw that away is to denigrate it and to blaspheme it. Do you understand that? Do you understand what I'm saying? That you're blasphemous. Why? Because you're saying, some, you're saying God's a liar and you're saying that what he did for you and bought and paid for you isn't of worth. Yeah, maybe nobody heard that. It's okay. It'll sink in. My mom comes from royalty. That's why she carries herself a certain way. It has framed her life. We'll talk about it more next week because it's Mother's Day. 
But it has framed her life and it has framed my life because I know I came from royalty too. Can you say amen? There was things like, and it's silly things, like only certain people came into our house. She only, she only associated with certain people. Can you see where that could be protective for a child? Do you see that? There was only certain people that came in the house. She didn't let just, you know, she, she went through a period where, you know, she could have, you know, dated men, and man, we didn't see none of them. We, she kept them at arm's length. Now, understand that, because many of us, we get associated with things that we have no business being associated with, but it's because of our self identification. Can you say amen to that? Well, because I'm a wretch or because I'm a monkey, I'm descended from monkeys, I can just throw my body around and, and sort of live a, a based on instinct. You know, God's called you above instinct. You know, our children, our sons need to hear more than just, oh, well, you know what, you're a boy, so this is what you're going to do. They need to hear that they're royalty and this is what they don't need to do. Can you say amen? And are our limits good? Yeah. Yeah, they are, because you have to understand where you're living. This is why I challenge you not to make your children afraid of everything and feeling like victims. Why? Because they're actually victors. And the more you talk to them about being victors in life and being, being ordained to be sons and daughters of God, the higher they will climb. Am I the only one that sees that? How many shows do you have to watch where these kids, you go, they go into the inner cities with these kids, and they don't tell them they're victims. They tell them, hey, you can do this. You're better than that. They start to challenge them up, not down. Anybody say amen to that? No, it doesn't work. I, you know, you could say that that sounds like a certain leaning. No, I want it to work. The thing that works is elevating people, not denigrating people. It li you lift them up. You talk to them as Jesus would talk to them, as victors and overcomers, not people who are trampled down and can't get up. That's not who we are. That's not how I was raised. My, my mom raised me to believe I was royalty. She never consciously said it, but I walked through life understanding that whatever barriers were going to be in front of me, I could overcome them. That's the picture I had in my mind. How many of you know that's what Christ also said to you? In this world, you will have trouble. Finish it. Finish that. What's that? But be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. Do you see it? Jesus never left us as victims. Ever. Every time we thought we were victims, he picked us up and he said, yes, child, but I'm going to wash you off. I'm going to bring you home. I'm going to celebrate your arrival and we're going to move forward in the kingdom together. I guarantee you that prodigal son came in and he was so glad to be home. He said, Father, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. Because I understand now the difference between living in the pit and coming home to live in the kingdom with you. Man, and you can't give somebody abundant life if they won't receive it. When you think that your identity is to just to be beat down, and I see people talking about, oh, well, that's a prosperity gospel. And I say, you know, often I remind them, I said, you know, there's a poverty gospel too. Because they're like, well, you know, these preachers, all they talk about is what you're supposed to get, and you're not supposed to talk about what you're supposed to get in life, except for Luke chapter 24. But... You're not supposed to talk about what you get in life. You're only supposed to talk about what you give up. And I was like, dude, that's the, pros that's, that's the opposite of the prosperity gospel. That's the poverty gospel. You know, we teach, we've taught the poverty gospel in Catholic churches for years. How many of you know that? For years. So we got some undoing to do. The Catholics have done some mighty things. They are beautiful people. I would never disparage the faith of Catholicism because it has opened the door to so many people coming to receive Jesus. It is, is it religious? Absolutely. Do they have it all together? Neither do we. Somebody say amen. Neither do we. The first time you realize that you're imperfect, I mean, you can't necessarily criticize everybody else because they're imperfect. At some point, you got to take it on. you got to say, okay, we all have some things we're working on. But they have taught the poverty gospel for many years. 
They've, they've taught the judgmental God gospel. Am I the only one? I grew up Catholic. Judgmental guilt. There's a thing called Catholic guilt. It is, because you, you grew up and it was like, oh my God, I got to be guilty about everything and I have to, you know, genuflect and self-flagellate. That's where those words came from, as if I can make the sacrifice of Christ over again and, you know, basically whip myself like, he, I, I get it, I understand what you're trying to do, but I'm not sure you're being effective at doing it. And so the challenge becomes, can we, can we actually redeem the rest of the gospel? Can we bring it to full revelation? And so full revelation, yes, there are some things. God does want prosperity for you. Can you say amen? He does. Does he want you to have a Corvette? I don't know, <laughs> okay? A Maserati, I joke around with that because it's like, well, I mean, God wants good things for me. He doesn't want things to have me, but he wants me to have things. And he wants me to have them in the right context, so he don't want me walking around with no shoes on. That's not what he wants. Yeah, but, but by the same token, he doesn't want me to worship the things, amen? So there's a balance between the two. And so going to the poverty gospel doesn't, doesn't help you with the prosperity gospel. Can you say amen? It doesn't help you. No, find the balance. Figure out what God wants for your life. Know that it's a balance of the two things. Be able to abound in a base, which was what Paul said. He did, be, you remember? What, okay, I'll say it again. He said, I am able to abound in a base. Everybody understand what that means, right? Maybe not. Content with having much or little. Yeah, plenty or want. I mean, I can, balance, I can work with either one. When I have plenty, what should I do with the plenty? What should I do? Give. <laughs> Amen? Get it out of here. Get it moving. Go give it to somebody. Help people that need to help. Absolutely. When you're abasing, when you don't have enough, what do you do? You actually, that's the trick of it. You give, right? You give out of what you have, out of your substance and what's going to happen. Now, here's, before, before you even answer that part of the question, our, our perspective is, well, you just give until you have nothing left and you don't get anything. I think that's what we're thinking. But what does Scripture actually say? When you give out of your lack, what happens? Thank you. God goes into overdrive, giving to you, so you're really not lacking, are you? Please, somebody say amen. You're not lacking. Why? But it's not because of you, is it? It's because God. God kicks into your life. See, if, if he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, are you ever poor? I mean, we have to, we have to think about those things. You're never poor. I'm never poor, even though there's not enough money in my bank account. Why? Because God is my father, and I have an inheritance in him, and I can go to him and be blessed. Am I the only one that operates that way? And I begin to confess. It's like, Lord, I ain't got a bunch of money in my, my account, but you own the cattle on a thousand hills, and surely you love your son enough to give me bread and not a stone. And that's the way I pray to him so that that flow starts to come. You know, sometimes the flow doesn't come because you don't expect it to come because you don't have faith for it. Oh, pastor, could you possibly say people don't have enough faith? Yeah, because there's times when I haven't had faith for things. And I know many things operate by faith. And therefore, when somebody challenges you to have more faith, don't get all warped about it. Don't get super warped about it. Don't get all offended. What they're challenging you is there's a way to get what you're trying to get. Can you say amen? They're not, they're, and, and yeah, I know people who get really worked up about it. It's like, well, they're saying I don't have enough faith. Well, I didn't have enough faith. There was a time I didn't have enough faith. There was a time I couldn't pray to heal, for healing for you because I didn't have enough faith for healing. Should I have stopped them? What do you think? Should I have just quit? Should I have gotten offended when people said, oh, man, you, do you, have no, you don't have enough faith to believe in your, when you pray for somebody that they're going to be healed? It would, would, would that have been the answer? Or just say, oh, well, I'm just mad at you Christians because you're telling me I don't have enough faith. No. You start reading the Word of God and getting more faith. Am I the only one that believes that that's the right answer? The right answer is to get more faith. Amen. You do. There's so many. Faith is not one of those things that you should frivolously talk about because it is intensely core to our faith to our belief system, and, and it's got many components to it. Love is one of them. 
there's so many components to faith that we should probably do a class on faith. Somebody say amen. We should. That's, that's man, it's, that's like grace. I mean, you can't, the kingdom doesn't operate if you don't use the tools of the kingdom. One of the tools of the kingdom is faith. Another one is grace. Please say amen. But my mom has come from royalty. How did I know that? Because of the way she raised me. How did it change me? I actually believe I'm royalty. I can look back in the genealogies. There was a, her mother is half black and half white. I bet you that the, the man that her, her, uh, her mom married, her mother's mother married, was probably some British guy that owned property in the Barbados, which is where we're from. I mean, that's probably what the story is. And there's probably some royalty associated with it. I'm going to dig into it now because I'm just intrigued. But for whatever reason, she believes she's royalty. That's why she carries herself a certain way. And she has raised kids that believe that they're royalty, and that's a good thing. Can you say amen? Now, we don't think we're royalty because of our lineage. We now, because she's introduced this whole thing of God and faith, that we believe our royalty comes from God, which is the proper place it should come from. Can you say amen to that? And that's why we're teaching on this particular topic. Remember that we're saved so that we would become faithful. So we're moving into the faithful kind of phase of this thing. We're saved as a seed that was sown in us, but we have to cultivate that seed. But let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. I encourage you to read 1 Peter all the way through. I'm going to spot through it myself. I've changed the pages, so I lost it. But that's okay, because it'll come back. Praise God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and it says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy mercy. God is pulling together people from this world to become part of his kingdom. His kingdom exists because he is king, but he is populating that kingdom with people who have been saved and covered and bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. Please tell me you heard me. Can you say amen? This is what God is doing. Now, you can say, well, pastor, you have no right calling yourself a, a, a royal priest. Yes, I do, because God called me a royal priest. He said, you're part of a royal priesthood. Do I have to learn how to be a good priest? Please, somebody say, yes. I have to learn to be a good priest. When the Le Levites were raised, they were taught to be good priests. Because it was a priestly order, but each one of those priests in training had to be taught to be good priests. Do you know you're being taught and trained and raised up to be a royal priesthood? Some of us accept that, some of us don't. You might say to yourself, well, why do I have to behave myself? Because you're being trained to be a royal priest. Why do I have to watch what I say? Because you're being trained to be a royal priest. Why do I have to understand my identity before God when I'm going before God and in his prayer? Because you're becoming a royal priest. Can you say amen? And that's only one part of the scripture. You notice how compound this is. And so, yeah, you got to read this over and chew on it. But you are a chosen race. Hmm. Hmm. Tell me about racism. Tell me about racism. I think we all have to reform our ideas because the world has convinced us of racial terms that are not biblical and concepts that are not biblical. And because of that, we've got to redeem our own thought lives to understand what a chosen race is. And I'm here to tell you, it's not based on what you look like. Can I just leave it there for now? A chosen race is not based on what you look like. It, because God, if you look at Revelation, you understand from every kindred and nation and tongue, understand those are very specific words. He didn't say from each race. Because there's only one. Please, somebody say amen. There's only one. And the question becomes whether chosen or not. I'll show you in Scripture where you were ordained at birth, even before you were born, to be part of this chosen race. Please then say hallelujah. Please. 
Please say hallelujah. See, because our understanding of what the world is talking to us about is tainted by our misunderstanding of the Word of God, our misunderstanding of what God intended and what He has done and what He is actively doing. God is actively bringing together His kingdom, and it is not based on what we call race. It is based on what He calls race. And in fact, He has chosen each and every one of us to be a part of what he would call a chosen race. Can anybody say amen to that? See, God wants to refresh our understanding. But then there is more. So it's a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people. I mean, how many times does he have to say it before he's like, I'm gathering together what will glorify me? Can you say amen to that? That's what he says. So that you may proclaim. Look at why he wants to pull it together. Number one, this is our identity. When you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you became a part of a nation and a race and a royal priesthood. Can you say amen to that? You, whether you're doing it or not is, is something for you, to Jesus, you and Jesus to talk about because you got to work on that. But you are called something that you may not be operating in right now. You are called that. That's your identity. And even more importantly, what's that identity for? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people. See, he's saying you were scattered. You were not a people. It's not like I'm pulling you from somewhere where you were a people. You weren't a people. You were not hanging together with anybody. You were not. You were different and dis you were just disconnected and flung out there. That's where you were, but now I'm going to make you a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. See, God is forming something here. And I love the fact that First Peter talks about it. But let's do something real quick about royalty. Understand what royal means. Number one, royal means of kingly ancestry. In other words, you're, you're descended from kings. Can you say amen to that? You are descended from the king. You guys are awful quiet. You are descended from the king. You were. And scripture actually says when you were born again, Something happened to you. So we're going from saved to then, what do I do with what this salvation looks like and how do I fulfill it? See, becoming faithful is to fulfill what it is that I believe in. Can you say amen to that? It's to fulfill it. It's to become it. It's to say, okay, if I'm a king's kid, what does it mean to be a king's kid? If I'm a chosen, I'm a royal priest, then what does it mean to be a royal priest? Because those things should define what you do with your life. Can you say amen to that? They should define it. So number one, we're of kingly ancestry. I don't care where you came from. I know where you're coming from now. All I need to know is how many people have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if you put your hand up, you're of kingly ancestry. It also says of or relating to or subject to the king. So in other words, you're under the king. Once you become royal, you are royalty under the structure and authority of the king himself. Everybody okay with that? You're not hanging out there by yourself. You're not just out from under any kind of authority. The devil can't just randomly attack you because you've got royal blood. Somebody say amen. And because you've got royal blood and the blood covers you, even if it's not in your veins, it still covers you. You have authority. Can you say amen? Do you understand why you can speak with authority and you can boast in the power of his might because he's your king? And because he's my king, I can speak boldly at the devil because he's from another kingdom. Can you say amen to that? You see how the structure starts to build. And then I begin by faith to believe that I am who he says I am. I am who he says I am. I am that son who has come home who believes God is God and I'm willing to submit myself to God and become who he says I am. So my challenge in life is not becoming who you say I am, it's becoming who he says I am. And there's an archetype. In other words, there's a model. I am both individual and unique, and there's a thing I'm supposed to be. You see the two? I walk in a station spiritually because my daddy's the king, and I have to individually relate to him and be that individual. There are both pieces. 
And this part of it, I'm trying to become more king-like. I'm become, trying to become more like the royalty I'm supposed to be. Man, I'll tell you, all these things start to connect, don't they? Why does God say you're set apart? Because you're royalty. But doesn't that say you're supposed to lord yourself over other people? No, Jesus said not to. He said, we're not going to be like that. We are not those people. We are the people that serve people out of our royalty. Can you say amen? That's what he did. He served people out of his royalty. That's why they didn't want him to wash their feet. Because somehow this king bowed his knee and served his people. And that was a model that broke everything human. It broke all of our expectations as to what leadership was supposed to be. And they had a hard time with it. They couldn't even let him wash their feet. They had a hard time with that. Because it was a leadership model that they had never seen before. And man in his nature and his flesh would not have come up with, can you say amen? We would not have come up with that. That would not have been the picture. Remember, they didn't, they didn't really receive him 100% because it's like, you're supposed to come with armies and stuff. You're supposed to be the king. Well, the king comes with armies and he takes over, doesn't he? And our king came and he died on a cross. And that was something that from our standpoint, we had to spiritually understand because it was nothing like what we expected. Nothing like it. That's why the Jews today are having a hard time because the way Jesus came was not like it was supposed to happen. It was not supposed to be that way. Even though Scripture says what it was going to be, it was hard for them to relate to. How many of you know it's hard for you to relate to it too? Isn't it hard for you to relate to what Christ says? Are you, will, you, will you admit that? It's hard for you to because he comes at you at so many different ways. It's not something according to your flesh. He says, love your enemies. How many of you are comfortable with that? (laughs) All in favor? Hmm. Didn't think so. He says, forgive as you've been forgiven, not as they deserve. How many of you can relate to that? He says, lose yourself to find yourself. How many of you can relate to that? How many of you can relate to that? See, this is going to require that you lose a lot of what you've been taught or what you think out of your flesh or what you feel out of your emotions. It's going to require that you let go of that stuff because there's no other way to follow Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? you got to lose some stuff. That's why he said you got to lose yourself to find yourself because if if I left it up to you, you'd think this through a certain way and you'd be 100% wrong you wouldn't understand it. You'd think you're supposed to be a doormat when you're not. You're supposed to be a servant to the Most High God. Come on now. Some of us serve out of a lack of self-esteem, and that's not a good way to serve. But it's just not a good way to serve because you don't serve well that way. As a king, you are a queen you can serve in a way that's royal and so sometimes we got to let go of those things in order to do it the way god says to do it the third piece is really being in the king's service see because if you're royal then not only do you have a kingdom that you respond to and are under its authority you actually have an agenda that's based on the kingdom and not your own you have an agenda that's based on god now i'm here to tell you the way you get the agenda and you get the instructions and many of you may know this how do you get the instructions about God's agenda how do you get it you need to know because you if you're gonna be following orders you need to know where the orders are coming from anybody say amen to that you need to know how to get the orders I gotta know what frequency to dial in order to hear my commander I have to there's something I have to connect to what is the way that you get orders how do you get orders Prayer. Amen. You tune in in prayer. And see, there's this magnificent... See, God has actually facilitated everything that we need to actually be victorious on the earth. If we want to poo-poo it and say that he's not done it, I'm here to say Jesus is seated on the throne. He's not doing no more. And the reason I say that is so you would understand that it's already laid in front of you and go get it. Prayer. Listening. Hearing God. Using the word of God to allow him to speak to you. 
All those things actually give you the ability to follow his agenda. Number four was suitable for those, those related to the king. I mean, this one, this one could explode. Royal means that you hold yourself in a certain way. Yes, I do believe that we actually encourage certain things in our life that we don't need to encourage. Because like the prodigal son, we think we can just go over there and throw our bodies around and we can lay around in the mud and nothing bad happens. And in fact, bad happens. But even more importantly, it's beneath you. Can you say amen? It's beneath you. I saw something on Facebook and it really was interesting because it was so poignant. It was just like, and, and, and again, I'm not making the point about what it said. I'm making the point that it said it. And it said, boyfriends don't get husband privileges. Now, what I loved about it was the stark nature of it. The fact that, man, it was like getting a cold slap in the face, wasn't it? It said, boyfriends don't get husband privileges. And it was challenging young ladies to hold themselves in higher esteem. Anybody with me on that? Am I the only one that sees that? It was, it was calling them to hold themselves in higher esteem. Boyfriends don't get pri husband privileges. Do you see the attitude that that would create in relationships for a young lady to believe that that's true? We want to solve things by fixing them down the road. I would rather solve them at the source of where they're happening because that's where I see God dwelling. Does that make sense? Now, this is not to make you condemned. It's to make you understand that God's truth can cut to the chase and cause you not to create problems that you don't need to create. Does that make sense? This is why I love God's truth, because that's where it comes out, poignant things that at first you might be offended. You'd be like, what are you telling me? I'm just telling you what works. That person was just trying to encourage young ladies, hey, this is the way it works. And yes, hold yourself in higher esteem because you are royalty. How many of you believe that if ladies walk, if they believed they were royalty, there's certain things that wouldn't happen? Come on, then say hallelujah. hallelujah. Do you know men have to think of themselves as royalty too? I'm not going to just pick on ladies. Come on. I'm not going to just pick. There's no reason to just pick on ladies. The issues we got are because of both sides. Somebody say amen. The issues we got is because men don't think that they're royalty and ladies don't think that they're royalty because somehow we got convinced that we were descended from apes and all kinds of things and we're all victims and we grew up in the mud and we got to follow our nature. All those lies from the world that we have to undo because they're bringing havoc on the earth. And we wonder why the Ten Commandments were ten. How many of you know there were many more than that? Read the scripture. There were many more than ten. As he was coming down the mountain, he tripped. And he dropped them. And there were many more. We understand that there were many more than ten. Why? Because God was trying to tell us how to live. He was trying to tell us, if I could just get you to follow ten. If I could get you to follow fifty. If I could just get you to do some things that cut to the chase and they're true and you would follow them, the kingdom principles, there would be blessing in the earth beyond your measure. Do you believe that what God tells us to do would actually help us solve the problems that we have? How many of you believe that? Whether we have fought, now I have to end with this piece of it. Because of the devil, that's why. Because the devil would want you to hear me say, but if you messed up, there's no recourse. There's no cleaning it up. And that is not true. This is why repentance is important. God can clean up the results of your action. But more importantly, he wants to change the course of your life. He wants to change the course of your life. And so sometimes there's examples in our lives that we have to look at that say, that wasn't the right thing to do. God told you not to do it. And it brought pain and suffering in your life. So what God wants you to do is repent. He wants you to turn away. He wants you to teach your kids not to do that. Do you understand? 
He wants to turn the course of the generations by having a group of people who are willing to be the king's kids and follow the king's mandates, to follow his instructions, to not look at it as if it was a bunch of rules. You know, I, if the king tells me rules, don't you think the king knows how to bring prosperity? Don't you think the king knows how to bring blessing? At least the king that I serve. I no longer push back on his rules as if they were to hurt me. They're not to hurt me. Those aren't to hurt me. Those are because he believes I'm his kid and I'm royalty. Those are so I would raise the standard and raise the bar in my life so I could be a good example to someone else. Those are so that God can heap blessings on my life so I can then distribute them because now I'm abounding and not abasing because I'm operating his principles and therefore I have plenty to give out. That's what God wants to do. He wants you to represent him as the scripture said that you would extol him, you would glorify him, and by your actions and by your life, you would bring blessing to others. How many of you believe that that's what God wants out of his kids? And that's what God wants. And that's what it is to be royal. Again, think of my mom. She's probably the best example I could tell you because you wonder why she carries herself the way she does how she has the composure and the presence that she does is because she believes she's royalty. Can you say amen? But I'm also here to guarantee you it doesn't come from the flesh. It comes from her understanding of who her king is and her abiding with him. Stand with me this morning.